Our scripture reading this morning is from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, be the first 11 verses. Paul speaking, he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, trustworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they who we preach, uh, or they, so we preach, and so you believed. So is the word of God. We'll dismiss our children now. You may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word. We thank you for your word that gives us insight to your love, your mercy, your grace, and how to draw close to you. And as we open your word, we ask you to open our minds to receive that which will cause our walk to be stronger and our witness to be greater. We pray this in Jesus' name. Paul, as you recall, we've been going through, gone through 1 Corinthians for quite some time now. In the first 12 chapters, Paul was addressing what was a problem uh, actually in the city of, of uh, Corinth itself. And that was just uh, carnality, immorality, uh, selfishness, uh, do what you please, a sense of arrogance, uh, uh, seeking, <laughs> seeking self-importance. Now, how does it do that when it's off? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, speaking of self-importance, uh, no. <laughs> so, you know, he was dealing with this church being raised up within the framework of this community. And over a period of time, he could see from some letters that were written and some other information, and plus uh, possibly his own uh, visits as well, but he could see that this immorality and carnality was creeping into the church. That they were accepting some things that were not acceptable before the throne of God. And so, uh, he speaks to them very directly. And in the first 12 chapters, or 11 chapters, uh, this is what he was primarily dealing with. And then in chapters 12, 13, and 14, he was dealing with the gifts of the Spirit, how they had elevated one over another and, and this type of thing. But he turned around and emphasized something that is for, the, for us all to really catch a hold of, and that was chapter 13, so frequently called the love chapter. But the, the picture of, of how important it is that we realize that we are to do all things in love. And that is a good check mark 
you know, if you're if you're feeling frustrated with something and you feel like you need to talk to somebody, that may not be the best time if you're feeling frustrated and upset. Take a step back, pray, and ask for God to give you some grace and 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 calm you down because you want to approach, if necessary, this person with love and compassion. And this is what Paul wants us to see uh, in chapter 13. So 12 and 14, dealing with the gifts. Chapter 13, dealing with the fruit of the Spirit, love. And in chapter 15, we come to the resurrection chapter. And I want you to look at verses 1 and 2 again. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And the picture here is, is basically, we, you know, well, he starts, let's put it this way, he starts with this idea, I want to remind you. Uh, I, I have preached to you. And you received. In other words, you heard it, you responded to it, you received what I had to say, the implication by this phrase is that you have received the gospel, the good news. And what is the gospel? It's, it's not just the cross. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and the forgiveness of our sins. And, and so he says, you've received this good news, if you will. And so this good news that they received is, is explained in verse 3. And so I'm going to take a couple of things out of order here. I deliver to you of first importance that which I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised in accordance with the Scriptures. The Gospel covers this whole picture. And by the way, you notice that the Gospel was understood because someone what? Taught it preached it. They couldn't have received it if someone hadn't gone out. That's really important in other areas of Paul's teaching. Someone's got to go and make sure this gets preached. And so he says uh, it's, this is of first importance for him. He says Christ died and he just didn't die. He died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised. You see three parts that are critical to the gospel here. He died for our sins. We have to remember constantly. And that's why he's talking to them this way. He wants them this to be foremost in their thinking. That we are sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. Without Christ, we are damned. The grace that he has bestowed upon us isn't just saying, I forgive you. That wasn't enough because of God's holiness. It required a complete alteration, if you will, of what existed in, this, in, the, in the world in the sense of sinful man. Somebody had to make a sacrifice that could cover man's sins no man could do it it has to be something perfect unblemished it has to be something ultimately that was willing the sin all the sacrifices of the Old Testament that led up to this was simply pointing to the need God has a, a, a set of of laws and commandments that he that are required to be close to him and because we are not holy he is holy but we have failed he he has to come and he desires to restore the fellowship and he does it through the cross Christ died for our sins something we could not fix ourselves I can't fix it for you. You can't fix it for me. We can't fix it for our children. It requires 
each and every person making that personal commitment to receive the gospel message. In his dying for our sins, it allows us to be in the presence of God because it covers us. Our sins are removed. God views us through Christ, basically, and sees us as holy. And now the scripture says, be holy, you know, because God is holy. The only way you can come in front of, of Him is to, to be holy. We can accomplish that, not ourselves, but through Christ in us. And death, you've got to understand this idea of He died for our, our sins and, and spared us from our death. Now, somebody say, well, I'm still going to physically die. Yeah. And somebody says, well, unless I'm in the rapture. Guess what? Even there the seed transcends and death happens instantaneously in the twinkle of an eye and, and, and what is mortal is put off and what is immortal is put on. So the reality is, is that to, to come before the throne of God, we must die. And, and, and the way we die starts with accepting Christ. Somebody says again, though, no, I physically die. But instead of Hades, we have eternal life with Christ. We are with the Lord, and I believe that happens as soon as we cease breathing here. I know there's all sorts of ideas out there about it, but I'm confident. Paul said this, uh, to, to live as Christ, to die is gain. But even more so on the cross, Jesus speaking to the thief, and the thief speaking to Jesus he says to Jesus, when you come into your reign, you know, let, let me be there. And Jesus says, this day. And it's a literal statement. It means today is going to happen. You're going to take your last breath here and you're going to be there. This day. And look at how he puts it. You will be with me in paradise. Jesus died, and I believe literally went to hell and paid our sins. And only he, you realize that Jesus knows what it's like to be eternally separated from the Father? Because that's the penalty. It had to be paid in full. He, but only an eternal being could do that and come back. But now you can start to understand what he was going through in the garden. The agony that he was experiencing. He was going to know, actually, what no man who follows him will know. We'll never know that agony. so blessed. Jesus died for our sins. We couldn't fix ourselves, so Jesus did it for us. goes on to say that he was buried. And it's important to grasp this because I, you, this, is, this is the part where, where so many people start to detour even in, in churches that wear the name Christian. Uh, was he was he really buried? Uh, you know, and if he was buried, was he really dead? I don't know how many of you know all all of the books, especially in the sixties and seventies that were coming out. My dad was very concerned about my interest. I wasn't even a Christian at the time. Uh, my interest in uh, Christianity, uh, you know, in high school, I. I uh, dated a couple of girls that were Christians and they talked me into going to church with them and my dad thought, uh-oh. You know, and, and so uh, he bought me a book that he had read and it was uh, called The Passover Plot. And it was the current contemporary book that dealt with the idea that, that Jesus wasn't dead in the tomb. 
I'm not going to go into any great detail other than the fact that, that you know, you have to look at this and think about it. The disciples, first off, had to request permission to take the body off the cross. The soldier that was there had to be sure that he was not breathing. In fact, one soldier to expedite his death did what? Pierced his side. What poured out of his side? Blood and water separated, which means his heart was not functioning. And they, they took the body off. And not only did they take it off, but then they had to carry it to the tomb. No, if, if there was any reviving that was going to happen, it, that whole jostling process would have, should have made something happen. But they carried him to the tomb. And not only in the tomb, but they laid him out and, and, and quickly wrapped him uh, in, in cloths and put a, a, in his body in cloths and then wrapped his face and his head in a cloth. And, and so uh, they saw him, they touched him, they placed him in a tomb. And since this was something that was common practice within the framework of the community, they didn't have mortuaries like we have today where we, we take something and uh, someone and, and leave them and, and then their service comes. You know? They handled it all themselves. They knew what death was. And they attest the fact that he is dead. He was dead. And so he was buried. But then, it says, he was raised. He was buried and then he was raised on the third day. He was raised bodily. We know this because of a number of things. For one, they touched him. They could, could physically touch him. They saw him eat. They walked with him. He was with them for 40 days. They had opportunities to sit with him, talk with him, you know, minister to him possibly in a sense. And, and, and it was clear this man is physically resurrected. Not a spirit, not a mass hallucination. So many things thrown out again as to possibilities of what they were seeing. This was the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was on the cross. He died. He was taken off the cross and he was buried. And he came out of the tomb alive physically in the flesh. A bodily resurrection. Paul says about this gospel message, this is the essence of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says about this, he says, this gospel I preach to you, which you received, in other words, this is your teaching that you received, in which you stand. I thought, what a powerful word to, you know, to say, to stand. It, and it means to stand without wavering. And then I remembered a psalm. Over the years, you've all heard me use it multiple times for different aspects of looking at Christ. But I love this psalm because... It's one that comes to my aid frequently. Psalm 40. David writes, I waited patiently for the Lord. This word patiently, by the way, I might I'd take a quick detour. This word patiently means also expectantly. I was patient, but I was expecting something to happen. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me. He came to me. And he heard my cry. God hears our cry. He sees our situation. He knows exactly what to do. And it says, He drew me up 
from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. You ever been in a crevice or, or a little indentation that's extremely muddy and you're in the bottom of it and you need to get out? How awkward and difficult that is? Well, the bog is, is, is complicated even more so. How many of you are familiar with the south end of Humboldt Bay? When the water's out, you can see all the ground out there. That's a bog. You know there's trucks buried out there? There's people that got out there on their, in their trucks and, and to, to go clamming or, or whatever, and, 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 and uh, the next thing you know, the tide starts coming in, and the thing sinks. This is David where he was. I'm stuck in a miry pit, a bog. Uh, uh, I can't get out. I can, I can climb all I try, and I can't get out. I need help. And the irony of this is the pit, technically, if you, if you go into the research of the psalm, you will find out the pit is of his own making. In other words, it's the pit of his sin. And he can't get out from underneath it. That's the imagery here. That's all of us, by the way. Without Jesus Christ, we're in that pit. And it's a miry bottom. We can't get out. We're stuck. We need help. He calls out to God. And look what God does. It says, out of, he, you know, he, he lifted me, He drew me out of the pit of destruction, and He set my feet upon the rock, making my steps secure. This, by the way, is a messianic psalm. Who is the rock? Jesus Christ. It's exactly what, the, what happens to us. We believe in the buried and, and the, the death of Christ, the, the, the fact that he was buried and the fact that he was resurrected. And as we receive that, we are pulled out of the miry clay. Not of any work that we did ourselves, but through the work of what Christ has done. And then we are placed... On the rock. The rock becomes our foundation. We are built up on the rock instead of the shifting sand. And as a result, we are now able to stand with Christ. But it's because He is holding our hand. He is holding us up. He has sustained us. There's a, this next picture, so important. It says, you stand there and, which you, and, and by which you are being saved. Being saved. I thought I was saved. And it's important to, again, pick up one more thing. There's a point in time where salvation enters your life and you are saved. And there's a point where it is completed. God will complete the work he has started in you, Paul writes. And we will have our salvation complete. In between time, we are in the process of being saved. Not saved over and over and over and over again, but being saved meaning working out your salvation, which is another phrase that is used. But the, the picture is, is that we are in the process of growing closer, closer, closer to what the Lord wants for us be. It's not a stagnant thing. Oh, I accepted Jesus Christ and I can run off and do whatever I've done. That was what was entering into the Corinthian church. And so he makes sure that they understand the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has been for your sins. He died on the cross for your sins. You've received this already, but I'm telling you again. And not only that, it's, it's a process. It doesn't just happen, but it's a continual walk, allowing the Holy Spirit to come through you and bring you and, and in your prayers and in your, your reading of Scripture and in your interaction with each other in fellowship to strengthen and to draw each other close to God. 
put it here just, I am saved, I'm being saved, I will be saved. It's a process and it's all one picture. I have salvation. I don't have to fear that. Because He has saved me. And now through the Holy Spirit in me, He's working out my salvation to its completeness. Or in heaven that will say, Welcome, saved Bob. <laughs> All this came as he continually reminds them, I, I, I preached to you. Again, he says in verse 2, I preach to you, and, and you received. And as we have received the gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, we need to be reminded over and over and over again how amazing that is. How amazingly loving God is. I was talking with someone the other day, happened to be uh, where I was at the same time, uh, waiting for a doctor's appointment, and the person was talking about how they couldn't believe that God allowed them to be sick like they are. And my comment to them was, I said, you know, they they were talking to me, so I talked back, (laughs) and uh, I said, well, my faith says that Uh, the sickness is the result of my sin, but that sin isn't going to kill me. It's not going to separate me from God. God has delivered me from my sin. But I live in a fallen world nonetheless. And my flesh is still fallen flesh. And I'm subject to the things fallen flesh are subject to in a fallen world. So I had tonsillitis. (laughs) I've had the flu. I've had the mumps. I've had the measles. I've had all the things that get to go with those. Shingles, etc. And obviously, all you know, is I've had a few battles over the last few weeks. But it's not God punishing me. If anything, He uses those opportunities as my fallen flesh gets taken by things of the world, if you will, uh, and, and, and I'm subject to those things. He uses those things to do what? Bring me into prayer even closer. To bring me into his word even more. In fact, amazingly, sometimes to give me more time than I've been allowing myself to do that. God wants to get our attention, even as believers, to draw us closer and stronger to him in our walk with him. And the interesting thing is, that in a doctor's office or in the hospital, they need to hear the gospel there too. Very special lady in my life. I never saw her well. And uh, she had cancer. She'd battled it. She'd been battling at the time that I met her for about 10 years. She was the most amazing lady, full of grace, couldn't, ha- couldn't wait to just see a, a, a fresh face and just say, do you know the Lord? <laughs> and of course, she's in the hospital and they're, they're okay, I'll listen. I don't know how many people's lives she touched. She gave away her Bible, I don't know how many times. And as I was talking with her, I wasn't a pastor yet, I was, but I was, I was in, involved with visitation in the hospital. And uh, I, uh, I told her, Miriam, that this doesn't seem right. That as much as you love the Lord, as much as you serve the Lord, that you're here. And she says, do you know how many people I get to witness to here that need to hear the Lord? She says, and I've got a captive audience. They can't just run away. I talk to doctors. 
I talk to orderlies. I talk to cl- people that clean my room. I talk to the, the, the ladies changing my sheets while they hold me in the wheelchair. She says, I, I talk about it all the time. She says, God has given me a platform to share the gospel. I had my eyes open that day, by the way. Amazing thing was two days later, they're wheeling her down the hallway. and She had promised the Bible to an orderly. And he was walking the other way. She was going in for a surgery. And she says, tells the people to stop. And she talks to him for a second. And he sa- she says, on my nightstand is my Bible. I would planned to give it to you and I, uh, today, but I, they've got other plans for me. She says, in the back, there's several scriptures. I want you to make sure that you know those scriptures are there and that you would look them up. And she didn't ha- hesitate to put them in a bind in the sense of saying, now you promised me? <laughs> and uh, he went down and got her Bible. Guess where he was the next Sunday? She passed away during that surgery. Guess where he was the next Sunday? He was at church. It wasn't immediate, but after a few Sundays, he accepted the Lord. The last thing she did. That's what God, you know, people say, is, is that for all of us? It's for every situation that God puts you in to have the opportunity. Is every situation an opportunity? No. But to be what? Prepared. Lord, use me. The gospel message, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, the death he died for our sins, his burial and his resurrection, bodily, physical resurrection. While we did not yet love him, he loved us and went to the cross for us. We share communion every Sunday. That's not a common practice in most non-denominational churches and churches outside of the Lutheran and Episcopal or Catholic churches. Uh, But the reason we do is because you can't find better symbolism for what Christ has done for us than to take a few moments to just remember and think about what Christ has done for us. To draw close to Him, to examine our lives and our hearts and our minds and to say thank you you've done and to share in the cup and to share in the bread we choose to do it every Sunday because I believe it's an ideal way to bring the service to a conclusion some people think it's like we just tacked it on at the end no we saved it the best for the end and so we have a way of sharing communion here And that is, as we're singing our song for communion, uh, that you have the opportunity to come up here and pick up the communion. Ever since COVID, we have not been passing the the plate and or the the offering or the the communion. And uh, so we come up and we pick it up ourselves while we're singing. You can pick it up for someone else as well. Everybody has to walk up here. And there, on this side is the cup with the uh, plastic top on it that, that basically seals off the bread. And then there's another cap and it seals off the cup. So the bread and the cup are in that. And, and uh, as well as on this side, we have two cups, one with the bread and one with the, the fruit of the vine. In it. And so I invite you to come up here and to take it and hold it until we've all been served. And then we'll share it together in just a few minutes.
Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper, sharing with the what we traditionally call the Last Supper with the disciples. It says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing the bread, He broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Sharing the bread. Then Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink it again, the fruit of the vine, until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us share. Father, we thank you for these emblems that remind us of who you are and what you have done. The sacrifice made on the cross. We thank you. That even though we had not yet loved you, you loved us. 
We ask, Lord, that you would make this amazing grace, this amazing gift, bigger in our hearts and minds, allowing it to take over the way we think, the way we talk, that we might be a blessing to you and to others. Cause our witness to grow and be stronger. Cause us to be bolder in that witness. And we ask, Lord, that as we leave today, that you would go with us. As we continue the fellowship at the park, that you would cause it to be a time of enjoyment and drawing close together there as well. Again, we worship you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Would you stand as we close, as we sing, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
Let's have a good rest of the day. Enjoy the fellowship at the park and uh, just uh, all around have a good rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen.